Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Danielle Lazor Thompson. I'm the American Indian Law Program Fellow here at Colorado Law. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be here um, among so many people that I've only read your work and maybe seen you speak in other conferences. So it's just it's a wonderful a wonderful space to share with you today. Um, I am from Akwazasne, um, which is the Mohawk Reservation in northern New York State. Um, I'm an attorney licensed in New York, and I've been in Boulder for all of one month today. <laughs> I moved out here with my daughter, and we're very happy to be here for the next year. Um, first, I'd like to introduce um, the title of the panel, which is Vine Deloria Jr., Initiator, Instigator, and Warrior. And I've been told that this panel is not going to give me any difficult times with um, time limits and stuff like that. But these are activists. These are people. I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to tell them anything. <laughs> um, so first, I'd like to introduce Chase Iron Eyes. Um, he is going to be our first presenter. Chase Iron Eyes is an attorney for the Lakota People's Law Project um, and was raised on the Standing Rock Nation and now lives in Oglala, Lakota Nation. Chase is working to liberate indigenous nations by deconstructing the ongoing colonial oppression executed against indigenous nations and empowering others to pick up the fight to re-spiritualize our collective experience, which has been chemicalized by the colonial forces of extractive capital, separating humans from their sacred. Chase co-founded the Last Real Indians media model of frontline reporting in addition to an uncensored critique of the issues of the day as a way to give voice to the voiceless, presence to the unseen, and action to prophecy. Chase is a spokesperson for the Leonard Peltier Freedom Campaign, as well as the public relations liaison for Julian Bearrunner, the president of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Chase is married to Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, and they're raising their family in Lakota Treaty Land. Chase? No, let's use this one. Sorry. Hi. I'm very uh, honored to be here. I was, I was excited to uh, lend, you know, a voice, just an extra set of eyes and perception to uh, a gathering such as this. If you take a look around the room, around the auditorium and, and you see who's here. You see who uh, Vine Deloria had impacted over the course of his life. And I can't, I can't fathom how he wrote that many books. I've been trying to write a book for about, I don't know how long now, one day. So I always appreciated that about him, just dogged determination. And he, he's a guy that, for me, um, just, he, he was willing to punch a bully in the gut. Intellectually, though, spiritually, he, he just, he, he represented um, original indigeneity that is a million years old, that is two million years old. He, he, he gave us the authority to stand and look, those uh, Western um, constructs, you know, right in the eye and, and be able to not be subsumed by them. What, what a lot of us don't realize and what Vine taught, what, he, what I learned from him is that we all have gone through a process of colonization, a colonization of, of the spirit and the mind, or what he might have called spirit and reason. He has a book called Spirit and Reason, which I love very much. I love uh, the world we used to live in. I mean, you, you name it. And, and to be honest, I didn't read, I don't know if I've read a full Vine book, actually. You know, full disclosure, but I've watched his videos. Well, I, t I was 17 years old, or 16, when I tried to read Custer Died for Your Sins. And I, I didn't have the, the vocab, the vernacular, the lexicon, all that. I, I, didn't, I just didn't have it. It was trying to grab onto something that I just couldn't quite understand yet. So I started with Black Elk Speaks instead of Custer Died for Your Sins. 
Because, you know, my, my mother had raised me in a way that, uh, uh, in original dignity, even though expressed in a foreign software operating our consciousness, the English language, because we have people like Vine, who obviously carried with them a very complex and clashing set of worldviews, set of archetypes, set of, of, of foundational ways that human beings um, inform their experience while here on earth. And so f for that, uh, I was extremely happy. Uh, I, we, I actually named my, me and my wife named our son, his middle name is Vine. Yeah, because I had gotten into law school in 2004, and I went to uh, DU, Denver. And I, I'm not paying a dime of that student loans until Elizabeth Warren and uh, some others forgive all student debt. <laughs> <laughs> they want that 120K, then come to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation <laughs> and ask, where does, where does Chase Iron Eyes live? It's crazy. Um, I grew I grew up on the Standing Rock Reservation, and uh, my father's from Oglala, Pine Ridge. I just want to uh, detour very quickly here because I was enrolled in the process of uh, tribal enrollment, the concept of blood quantum. Uh, I was enrolled, you know, unbeknownst to me, I I, I, I age out, you know, I, I go, I, I turn 18, change my last name from my dad's name to my mother's name. And then, you know, we, we all, when you grow up without a father, you go through certain things and, and you kind of you don't have too many reference points. So you kind of got to, you got to run with the pack for a while and hope that, you know, you don't get eaten alive. But we moved from Standing Rock to Pine Ridge and I, and I get there, I run into my, to my good friend who you know, we were, we were arrested together at last child's camp. If you remember the no dapple struggle, um, Stand with Standing Rock, 850 people arrested, uh, $3.8 billion pipeline uh, put in, $38 million spent by the state. Most of that money went to uh, private military contractors, law Check. Okay, don't let that happen. <laughs> Nobody better be cutting my mic out there. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, and it's so good to see Dr. James and I. Uh, it, it is, it is a, a, a privilege to be here. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't see uh, Professor Carpenter, Kristen Carpenter, yet. Um, she was one of my professors at, at DU. But anyhow, I get to Pine Ridge, run in my good buddy. He's running for the, the uh, tribal president. And so I asked him if he has a campaign team and all this stuff. He's got pretty much nothing. And so I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll be your campaign manager. Should never signed up for that. But we won. Uh, and, and it was time for me to like become part of his staff. And Pine Ridge, you got the, the Lakota live in seven different, uh, we're seven different bands and we were on several different tribal nations. So I, I go there and Obviously, I'm treated like an outsider, just probably because of the way I speak, the way I speak English, very different. A lot of code switching that I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to re-acclimate and go back to the, the res slang. But, you know, I went through the pro this, this attempted uh, assassination attempt, I'd call it. That's what academia kind of is. It's this whole set of constructs that tries to put you on this, on this railroad track where, you know, you, you, you're perceptions and, and the, the way that you look at, uh, give you a quick example, well, hold on, let me, before that, let me tell you what, what I was gonna tell you originally about Pine Ridge. I'm trying to get a job, they won't hire me. I don't know what, what the deal is, I, I, what, what's going on, and, and finally they say it's because of your background. So I get through that hurdle, and then, then the next thing is you're not a tribal member. You are not a tribal member. These tribal identities have existed since 1889, the modern ones, the, the Indian reservation ones. 
since 1889. That's when they split us up and gave us, you know, imposed this identity. You are now Pine Ridge. You're now Cheyenne River. You're now Standing Rock and so forth. So, you know, I had to have this very serious discussion with my children. I said, you know, uh, we're, we're from Standing Rock, but we're Lakota, and I'm about to become Oglala. I'm about to apply for the membership, relinquish from Standing Rock, and then become a tribal member in the modern sense of that word. I was becoming a whole different Indian, if you think about that. Also, my blood quantum increased by six or 26 percent maybe 36 percent i think i made a 36 percent gain in blood quantum just by switching membership it's the easiest geico you know what i mean <laughs> i felt more indian <laughs> the halo was coming off of me sage smoke was exu i'm just playing but I, the point is i had to change <laughs> my Indian membership, is that, that's crazy to think about, right? To, to, to just hold it for a second and be like, what? And that's how my kids responded. They, they just, they laughed at that concept, but I had to do it to get a job. And now, but I'm also tight, my father is from there. Got a lot of family there. It's the hardest place I've ever been. If you ever heard the phrase, poverty is violence, you know damn well Vine would be saying that. Vine invaded many different circles which were which were prior to our people kind of taking hold of our destiny a lot of those harbingers are also you know john echohawk is in the room too narf is in boulder narf works closely with cu all of these huge indian organizations that, that are now established the, the, the NCAIs of the world, the NIGAs of the world, all these collective representative organizations that, that speak for us. You know, Vine would be giving them an A whooping too. He would. Because if you think about our pursuit of self-determination, our pursuit of liberation, really that's what it is. We are born into spiritual liberation and political resistance, political navigation, the colonial process or, or, or the, the concept colonial state that is still attempting to usurp our original dignity, our original sovereignty, our ability to say, no, you're not going to build this pipeline through our treaty territory. We now reckon the whole planet is desperate my relatives you you know this and I, I know you know this and i know you're up late thinking about it because i am the amazon is burning right now and we need a different strategy what i liked about vine if if you uh, are ever engaged in indian activism there's there's a spectrum on one spectrum is you know the tokala or the warrior societies or aim or something like that on the other side is maybe our people who are now representatives in the United States Congress who have uh, uh, changed the whole dynamic. See, it's interesting to want to know what Vine would think about these kinds of things. But, but he's, he's left us in a place where we have to assert our own uh, intellectual authority. We have to make sense of all of it for ourselves because most of the people who now call themselves white, the Europeans that invented that concept of the white race, most people are not aware of that. Most people are not aware that Europe was colonized and separated from their sacred three to 5,000 years ago. What? Okay. No, oh, I didn't even hit any of the notes. Okay. Uh, so I, I wanted to think of what, what would Vine Deloria Jr. do or say about our situation. And I, I want to leave with this, because in, in this world that where we're trying to impact change, both sides of those spectrums that I was talking about throw each other, the, each other under the bus. You know what I mean? Bad jacket each other. 
And we can't be doing that. We have to recognize not only as within indigenous communities, I was talking about European colonization because we need you. We need this country to take a, a, a deep and a, a deliberate introspection. This, this is why we go into ceremony, so we can give ourselves space to do that. Um, it, it's been my honor to come here and just share with people. It, it's, we, we have one opportunity to make sure that our struggle that we know is very much a struggle. There is an ongoing legal, political, economic subjugation. All you have to do is look a little deep, maybe come to this law school so you can learn about it or follow Last Real Indians. There's my shameless plug. <laughs> anyway, it, it's Philip and, and the Deloria family. Uh, it, it's just been my sincere honor to be able to, to present in front of all of our relatives here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chase. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Faith Spotted Eagle. Um, Faith Spotted Eagle is a fluent speaker of the Dakota language and a member of Ehank Toan. Although she descends from uh, Shichangu, Humpati, Hunkpapa, and Madwa Kantuan of the Ocheri Peta Shakowin. Um, and has French-Irish blood through her grandmother, Julia Deloria and John McBride. In the Western world, Faith attended college at American University in Washington, D.C. and Black Hills State College, Spearfish, South Dakota, and earned a master's in guidance and counseling in her early 20s at the University of South Dakota. In the Dakota native world, she has been active in teaching the Dakota language in language nest settings, um, has been a 20-year member and coordinator of a revived traditional Braveheart Society, which operates a multi-purpose lodge. She comes from a Sundance family and has helped revive the coming of age ceremony for the last 20 years across the seven council fires. She was a recognized leader in the 10 year fight against the KXL pipeline intrusion into treaty, ter treaty territory since 2007. She was also an elder leader in protecting the horn of the um, Ocheti um, Shakoan camp at Standing Rock in 2016 which gained worldwide attention. Due to her lifelong work, she was recognized by what is called a faithless elector who cast their pre-designated vote for Faith Spotted Eagle in the U.S. Electoral College in the 2016 national election. From this, Faith received the first presidential electoral vote ever cast for a Native American in U.S. history. Which is cool. <laughs> Currently, Faith works in Native communities with her model, Healing from Red Rage, which has been widely used in Native communities in the U.S. and Canada. She also contracts with the Veterans Administration and many tribes and schools um, who are utilizing this model. She is a trained mediator, peacemaker, and incorporates traditional peacekeeping with Western approaches of peacemaking. Her priority is the preservation of the good medicine of the Dakota culture for the future. Faith. How about now? Okay. All right, I'm gonna to try to speed talk here since I only have 10 minutes and I have so much to say. Um, first of all, um, my grandmother was Julia Deloria. She was born at White Swan in 1804. So every year we go and throughout the year we visit and take care of the graves at our, it's like a ghost feast and we take care of our Deloria relatives including Auntie Alla and Susie who are buried at our homeland. And so I have a, my perspective is a little bit different because it's from a child, it's from a, a, an adult, and now as an elder. Because I knew um, Dekshi Vine mainly as like an older relative. And I knew him primarily through Grandpa Vine. And Grandpa Vine was always at our place. And then I would periodically run across Dekshi through the family interactions, uh, convocation. I'm sure Philip's been at convocation. I remember the first time I went to convocation when I was about 10 um, with my aunt, aside from my parents who, they always watched me very carefully. I was a beloved child, so somebody always had to watch me. And um, I remember my aunt and um, uncle was there during that time, during that convocation. And she was worried about me acting up, so we stayed in those old wall tents. Remember, Philip, those white wall tents? I got up one morning and here she had safety pinned the door. <laughs> and I thought, oh, next. So then I started acting out. 
So I started to wonder, uh, who was this family that I came from? And Grandpa Vine was constantly around us, and he had such a delicious sense of humor. And that's probably where Uncle got it, but he just, oh my gosh, just, you could listen to him for hours. So out of that, in my years, as I began to become an elder, I thought, what is it to be an elder? And I asked a very good friend of mine, who also was a warrior woman, uh, Rosalie Little Thunder. And I said, Rosalie, what is it to be an elder? And she thought about it for a while, and she always closed her eyes when she thought. She closed her eyes and she said, I think that when you become an elder, you're good to listen to. So those of you that are elders out there, if people are leaving the room when you're talking, you have a little bit of work to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I try to keep that in mind that you do have to be good to listen to. It's not to be bossy or privileged or any of that. It's just a delicious time because in our language we say wakanka. Wakanka means becoming holy. We are getting closer to that time where we get to see the relatives in the other side camp. So you have to act accordingly. <clears throat> and so, you know, it's, it's a delicious thing to be an elder. And I'm just um, really relishing it. But going back to um, the memories of how I saw him, I remember when I heard those stories growing up that he wrote about in um, the spirit book. Um, I heard those growing up, so it was really kind of strange when they came out in print, especially the one with the killing of the white buffalo. And in that story, it said that the family would have a really difficult time for at least four generations or more. I heard it was more than four generations when I was growing up, but I knew that story by heart by the grandpas and the grandmas. And my grandma was born in 1872, so sometimes I really feel like a relic because I was raised by somebody who died in 1976. And then my aunt died just three years ago, and she's, was, she left at 104, so I'm hoping that I have a ways to go with um, those kinds of genes. But <clears throat> I have so many stories that I carry, and it's totally relevant to what's happening today. And so it makes it easy to translate those, which is what um, Dekshi did. He made those translations to a language that is very difficult and confusing, which is English. Because in our Dakota language, it's very clear. When you say something like um, the woman who brought, besides white buffalo calf woman, when the creation story that we have, her name was Wo'ope. Wo'ope means the law. So the law, the spiritual teachings were brought by women because we are caretakers, you know, we give birth and all of that in a humble way. So the language has been a guide in understanding. And I, even though he didn't speak the language, I can see that he translated that feeling of that language into English, which must have been a horrendous thing to do. Because when I get confused by the dominant population of white America, I go back to, I translate it through my language and it makes sense. It makes total sense. Some of the English doesn't make sense at all. But I think the uh, thing that I wanted to share about him as an adult, I began defending the river at probably a year and a half. The, through environmental racism, the Pick Sloan, and it's written about in a book called Damned Indians by, um, what's his name, Chase? Michael Lawson. And he wrote about the theft of the Missouri River in our water rights. So I was a year and a half when I have memories of White Swan where my grandma Deloria was born. And I remember people carry, I saw this old white log cabin aged by the weather. And I saw them, people carrying things and I couldn't talk and I couldn't understand, but I could feel their anger and their sadness. And I was watching them taking all of their belongings out and they were actually burning some of the houses to make people leave. And so I have that memory. And then when I was 12 years old, so I could always feel that sadness, we were lucky enough to have land up on the plateau. So that's where I grew up, out in the sticks. I grew up as a little wild Indian. And when people would come to our house, we'd run to the trees. I didn't speak English until I was about five. So when at 12 years old, we were sitting along the river. And my dad looked at me. And I could tell that he was kind of wistful looking out where the old white swan community used to live, which is where the Delorius lived. And he said, you know, I'm a girl, when you, and I was 12 years old. I said, he said, when you grow up, you're going to have to do something about this river. And I looked at him and I said, I'm only 12 years old. And he said, you'll figure it out. And so that was kind of the first charge when I was 12 years old. I thought, how can I figure this out? What am I going to do? But those doors opened naturally. And I began to understand why my people love the river, continue to do that, continue to fight for it. So there came a time in 
1999, they had um, a conspiracy that happened between Daschle and our governor, not my governor, the governor, Jankel, and they conspired. There was a law called the Surplus Property Act, which meant that if you got done with, uh, you had literally destroyed native property, the feds, when they were done, they should give it back to where they had taken it, those taken areas. So there was all that river land that should have been given back to us that was taken. And then Dashiell and Janklow made a agreement, a conspiracy to give that to the state for wildlife habitat. And so we were very upset because we know that the graves always surface because the river is a burial area. It's a ceremony area. So there came a time when all of a sudden the Corps showed up at our headquarters or our casino and they said, oh, by the way, they met with our tribe and they said, there's about 40 uh, graves that have surfaced and the water has gone down. And of course, the historical trauma, I have a name for it now. It's called Red Rage. I'll try not to go into Red Rage this morning. but. Uh, everybody got angry. And of course, you know, to think those, some of those relatives I knew, my grandma's little girls. And so we went down to the river and a very spiritual experience began because when people, um, individuals surface and re-enter from the spirit world, they, they move at a different vibration. There's a different vibration in the spirit world and those, you know, when you get older, you realize those things, but there was a vif different vibration going on down there. And I went down there and all of the, anger and the trauma surfaced and I went down to the Corps of Engineers and I said, you need to stop the river. They let it, they have a um, undertaking with section 106, the National Historic Preservation Act. We've been fighting to say that every time they move the river, it's an undertaking and they won't accept that. They make their own rules. So I went down to the Corps and I said, what the H are you doing? You've, you've uncovered numerous relatives. You need to call Omaha and stop the river. Now remember this was during the Y2K and they were saying, you know, that all kinds of awful things would happen. So anyway, he looked at me. Um, um, his name was Tom Curran. He was the district manager. And he said, you know, Faith, there's not much I could do about this. This is controlled by Omaha. You know, I have nothing to do with it. It's going to happen. The water's coming up Friday. And I said, you could do something. And um, he said, I can't. And so I got really angry. Before I got red rage, I got walked out of the office. And then I was living back with Sichangu relatives because I'm part Sichangu. And I got on the phone and I thought, who can I call? And I called Dekshi. And I was crying and the snot was coming down and I was just, just out, kind of out of it. And I said, uncle, they're doing it again. They're uncovering our relatives. And right away he said, stop your crying. Wipe your nose. He said, you have work to do. And I said, okay, what do, what do I do? He said, you find yourself a good attorney, someone you can trust and get a TRO. And I said, what's a TRO? And he said, you restrain them and, and you can stop the river. You can do it and call me back. I got to go. And he hung up and I wasn't even done crying. And um, so I got ourselves a lawyer, Mary Wynn, and she filed a TRO. We took her to ceremony at the same place where I see a young relative, Carlton. How'd you get away? They, you ran away from home? <laughs> At the EOK of Galen Drapples, we did ceremony and we set the course because everything that we do, we ask the spirits to guide us. So we went to court and um, Judge Pearsall, it took a long time. It was a cold winter. It was icy. We would drive up and he, when the court came forward and all this time I kept in contact with Dekshi. He was kind of guiding us. And he said, I don't trust this lawyer, but I'm here. And I said, okay, I'll tell her. And uh, so we kept in communication with him. He was sometimes very intimidating. I can't imagine how a lawyer must have felt working with him. But um, we did win. We won. And they stopped the river. I remember the night that I got the call from the ACHP, Advisor Council on Historic Preservation. There were so many mysterious things that happened at our spirit camp from the other world. And I know that they were helping us. But I remember at 11 o'clock at our spirit camp, and I called Dekshi after that, um, <clears throat> the um, Stanfield, he called me from Denver, and he said, you know, everybody's going to be mad at me, and I may not survive my job, but I'm going to stop the river. He said, I'm going to call, I'm going to, um, I can't remember the word for it, when they stop the, when they enforce um, the violation of Section 106. And he said, I'm going to go ahead and do that. And so he said, it's going to hit the papers tomorrow. And um, he said, the court is going to do what they're going to do, but we're going to provide the direction. And so they stopped the river 
For six weeks, they terminated the programmatic agreement of the Missouri River, which they had enticed tribes to sign. And the coming months, we were to this day, we have not signed that programmatic agreement because they lie. They don't. It's just on paper. It's not. They refuse to consult. And so it's just a kind of a den of thieves that we deal with, and then um, it's reinforced by a government is that is probably the most violent country in the world, and we bear the brunt of that. And so my 10 minutes is coming up, but I wanted to share with you how much of a on-the-ground activist that Dick She was behind the scenes, even though he's a little bit crabby sometimes, and he'd say, just get it done, and so i try to get it done. And um, I look forward to getting to know um, Philip better, um, I, one last thing, if I'll talk really fast, is that one of the older Deloria families, and not just them, all of the people in our culture in, stress the importance of relationality. Everything that we do in life is as a relative. And so in the later years, as we come forward, one of the relatives, I'm, um, he's older than me, he's the oldest one in the Deloria family, which is Phil Lane, your uncle Phil Lane. Um, before his father died, Phil Lane Sr., he called my dad, and Philip and I had not known each other yet, um, your uncle, and so they, they said, you kids get home. We were old, but they said, you kids get home. I must have been in my 40s. And he said, you got to take care of something. So I got home, and the younger Philip was there, and they said, you two are cousins. You have to carry on these things. It's really important. Now you listen. So they talked to us for four days and told us some of the stories that uh, uncle knew, the family knew, and they said it's very important to carry those on. So I've, we've tried to do that, and the prophecy that I'm talking about said that the people would, who came out of that killing of the white buffalo, which was for a reason, it was a sacrifice, would carry on the leaf of the culture, but they would be tested. And for sure enough, uh, you know, we're tested all the time, especially on Facebook, right? But um, the younger relatives, and I'm glad Carlton's here, um, it's the, laid before them. And every generation has a gift, but we have to learn how to talk to each other. I have to learn how to talk to Chase. Because when we were at Standing Rock together, we didn't talk. So that's part of the charge before us, is to learn how to do the intergenerational stuff, which we did in the old camps. But colonization has taught us to be in isolation. One of the biggest things that we've learned from colonization to is operate in isolation. So obviously, we've all come together out of our isolation today. And it makes me happy, and I'm sure that Uncle's heart singing somewhere in whatever he's doing in the spirit world. Thank you. Um, Mark Trahan is the editor of Indian Country Today, and he's been writing about Indian Country for more than three decades. Um, he does a weekly audio commentary for Native Voice One that is broadcast via tribal radio stations across the country. Um, he has written a 140 character rhyme based on a daily news story. Um, he's been a reporter for the PBS Frontline series. Um, uh, the piece was The Silence, which was about sexual abuse by priests in an Alaska native village. He's also been an editor in residence at the University of Idaho, um, and again in uh, 2011 and again in 2012. He taught courses on media, uh, social media, the American West, and editorial writing. In, 20, in 2009 and 2010, Trey Hunt was a Kaiser Media Fellow writing about health care reform focused on programs and government, um, focus, focused on programs the government already operates, such as the Indian Health Service. He was recently the Atwood Chair of Journalism at the University of Alaska Anchorage and a faculty member at the University of North Dakota as the Charles R. Johnson Endowed Professor of Journalism. Trahant is the former editor of the editorial page for the Seattle Post Intelligencer, where he chaired the daily editorial board, directed a staff of writers, editors, and a cartoonist. He has also worked at the Seattle Times, the Arizona Republic, the Salt Lake Tribune, Moscow Pullman Daily News, the Navajo Times, Navajo Nation Today, and the Shoban News. Trahant is a member of Idaho Shoshone Bannock Tribe and a former president of the Native American Journalists Association. Trahan is also president of the board of directors of Vision Maker Media, an important funding vehicle for native films and media. Mark? No, no, the, now it's on. Okay, good. This is way better. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I, too, am honored to be here. Um, let me start with some housekeeping. Patty mentioned that everyone here has stories to tell. Well, I can help with that. Um, Indian Country Today wants to publish essays about this uh, toward the end of the month. 
And um, we're looking not only at how the book Custer Died for Your Sins impacted you, but also what's the manifesto for the next 50 years? So if you have an idea about that, please drop us a line and we will post it. So this, my story starts back at the Newberry Library and I was getting ready to speak and Peter Iverson came up to me and grabbed me and said, uh, Vine wants to talk to you before you speak. I wasn't sure what to expect and um, this is the first time I'd met him. So I walked up with Peter and I was greeted by What's the goddamned intellectual have to say today? <laughs> so I answered like anyone in that situation. I want to talk about epistemology. <laughs> Journalists learn a lot about who, what, where, when, why, how, and even sometimes why. But what we don't talk about is how we know what we know. What's the source of our information and what's the context? There is no chapter in Custer Died for Your Sin about press performance, but it's a theme that surfaces throughout the book, whether it's about the word plight or the chapter on termination. In fact, that chapter, probably more than any other, opened my mind to the power of the native press. When Lucy Covington led the fight against termination at Colleville, one of her key tools was the creation of the newspaper, Our Heritage. This publication, as well as the work by Covington, Vine, and others, framed the conversation at Colville. Custer died reflected the big picture of termination, the lust for more native land, but the vital work on the ground included the native press and how the story was told, one that was missed by the mainstream media, although it wasn't called that then. My speech that day really was about epistemology, and it turns out that the meeting was on September 13th, 1997, same day as today, an anniversary of sorts. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was less than a decade old, and I'd covered it from the beginning. And so that was the story I wanted to tell. When the act was first written about, the Philadelphia Inquirer captured the narrative in the press pretty well. It said, gambling on Indian reservations, a booming business of bingo parlors and small casinos would be subject to federal and state regulation under a bill passed by the Senate last week subject to federal and state regulation. But by September 1997, when this conference occurred, the story had flipped. Here is a version that was told in 1997 from Forbes magazine. It was a soft-headed idea from the start, hoping to appease a poor and politically embarrassing minority and their liberal allies. Congress in 1988 set parameters allowing American Indians to run casinos. Gambling would be the new buffalo for impoverished tribes. In 1988, Congress subjected tribes to regulation. By 1997, less than a decade later, Congress gave Indians Casino. Journalists use our own version of epistemology. We call it the boilerplate. It's the one paragraph that lazy writers use over and over to explain a story. It becomes our narr narrative explaining how we know what we know. Custer Died for Your Sins did that for an entire generation, too. Literature was once packed with stories of what something like this. Once there was a great chief, say Chief Joseph, who led his people past danger and outmaneuvered the powerful U.S. Army, but instead of climactic victory, Chief Joseph almost reached Canada. Almost. The Nez Perce people almost won. The American leader was almost great. Boil it down in story after story, and the condensed version of that history was reduced to an almost narrative. American Indians were included in the master narrative only in the context of almost and failure. Stories of dreams or successes were limited by that, and the rich, complex narrative of history reduced to stories that were flattened with each telling, pounded into thin, aluminum-like sheets that masked the truth. Custer Died for Your Sins took that old, flat history and crumbled it up until the dimensions were recognizable and honest. Most, Indian, most books about Indians cover some of the abstract and esoteric topic of the last century. Contemporary books by predominantly by whites trying to solve the Indian problem, Deloria wrote. Between the two extremes lives a dynamic people in a social structure of their own to be freed from cultural expression. That is how we know what we know. And it lets those who want to be educated in on the story. Deloria's telling included the radical idea that one of the best ways to understand a people is to know what makes them laugh. Laughter encompasses the lips, 
the limits of the soul in humor, life is redefined and accepted. Here was a book about American thought, policy, and history that devoted an entire chapter to humor, words that should have destroyed any stereotype of a wooden Indian. Custer died for your sins was also a manifesto. It demanded the right of American Indians to control our own image and our own details. Manifesto was precisely the right word, and it's often the one left out of the conversation, a declaration of principles, policies, and intentions in a political context. Custer was a dual manifesto. To many of us, it was a call to arms, a plea to recognize the power of stories, and how tribal philosophies and political systems and religions have a role to play. As Deloria wrote, there is more to the story than that, Indian people today have a chance to recreate a type of society for themselves which can defy, mystify, and educate the rest of American society. Yet the mill around like so many cattle, not bringing them to the surface the greatness in them. This manifesto to readers is a call for understanding, to give some people the unspoken that they have a chance to do better. Or the manifesto was a warning because, as he wrote, we shall wear them down to the last white man and finally outlast him. There was a conference last year after the election, and uh, folks were, in fact, Faith was there, coming together about what happens now and what happens in the next 10,000 years. And one of the points that I wanted to make was that if you think about the history of North America, Native people were here before the United States, and they'll be here after the United States. And sometimes that context gets lost in our narrow discussion about what's happening now. I would look, looking back at 50 years, that the most significant contribution in Custer Died for Your Sin was controlling our narrative, owning the story. But I also think you can point to the book for dramatically changing one profession, and that's anthropology. Every summer when school is out, a veritable stream of immigrants head to Indian country wrote Deloria. Indeed, the Oregon Trail was never so heavily populated as our Route 66 and Highway 18 in summertime. <laughs> These were the anthros, creatures that could be identified on reservations by their cultural gear, a camera, tape recorder, telescope, hula hoop, and life jacket all hanging from a frame. <laughs> Fifty years later, anthropology is a dramatically different profession. And there's a new test, a new standard. Custer died for your sins became a primer on how not to behave conjuring up the ultimate image of the tiresome meddler, one we dreaded and desperately hoped to avoid, wrote Elizabeth Grobspith in the book Indians and Anthropologists, A Critique of Anthropology. The new standards, to varying degrees, were a larger part of the reform of anthropology that began about the same time as Custer died for your sins. It developed new codes of ethics about research and conduct and very much a debate about, and with very much a debate and dissent. In the decades that followed this manifesto, Gloria said the attitudes of American Indians toward social scientists changed too. He described a plea to look for useful work, developing background and fishing rights cases on behalf of Native communities, for example, those seeking Native recognition, a whole list of ideas where the anthropology could be useful to tribal communities. Why not, he asked, use the values, behaviors, and institutions of tribal people to investigate the shortcomings of Western society. How do we turn that around? With that, um, I'm gonna, I know we're pushing time and we were under strict order, so I'm gonna pass. And, um, but I wanna make sure that um, I just mentioned that uh, it really is a great opportunity if you wanna um, pass on your thoughts to Indian Country Today. And I wanna tell you about one essay. Uh, we had an anthropologist who, uh, Immediately, we did a little blurb where we just mentioned we're doing this project. And he called one of the producers and said, uh, I really want to be a part of this. Can you send a, a film crew? And we did. And he said uh, he was a young anthropology student when the book came out. He read it, and he said it changed everything. He started going into the profession with a very different attitude. And he said, I wanted to thank him publicly for that. And that's one of the first videos we'll show when we show this uh, retrospective of 50 years. So thank you very much. So we have about 10 minutes left for this panel. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask if each panelist could share one brief story about, about Vine. Maybe if you could think about the funniest story that you can recall 
um, in your experiences working with this amazing man. Um, who am I going to put on the spot first? Chase looks like he's thinking hard over there. I, you, got you know what? I'm too young to have any personal. <laughs> but I met Vine. I'll, I'll go first. I met Vine, uh, I believe, a year after high school. Graduated high school in 1996. And the Standing Rock High School brought Vine Deloria Jr., a, a tribal member. He also changed his Indian hood from Yankton to Standing Rock. Um, anyhow, I, I met him there and heard him speak and just was inspired by him. I, 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 be, being that I don't have any personal uh, anecdotes with him, uh, Brother Mark Trahan asked, you know, what, the, what, the next, what does the next manifesto look like? And I think that's where this group, even everyone here, should be kind of thinking about that because as indigenous nations, we rarely, for instance, challenge capitalism. We rarely talk about corporate personhood or the corporate state. We rarely challenge the geopolitical initiatives of the occupying force that's in our country in holding our land in a state of illegal annexation. Sorry to load that up. <laughs> but we need to be thinking about Atonement for, for this country, those here who are descended from the original colonizers, those who are descended from the original civilizers, have never had a truth-telling, a, a simple sharing of truths. And so un, until we do that, un, until we share those truths, we're, we're always, our growth will always be stunted. Because we, we are, we're walking, talking challenges to the legitimacy the very legitimacy of this country. This country's rights only righteously, rightfully, and lawfully extend insofar as they're willing to honor those internationally binding agreements they made with, with me, with us, with, with Unchi faith. And we only have those rights we're willing to defend. So the, the next 50 years, the next 10,000 years has to include bridge building. And, and I think Vine Deloria Jr. was superb at that. So I, I just want to offer that. Thank you. Um, is the mic on? Mm -hmm. I think okay. so. Um, I think that Chase's summary of the impact on his younger life is reminiscent of young Native uh, scholars everywhere. Because everywhere I go, people talk about the impact that Dixie made on them. So he, he integrated that manifesto that you talked about, that we had the right to think differently. When you get to the ground level of being at ground zero, though, it's a little bit difficult for younger people because I have a granddaughter that's 20. And when she was a freshman, I, she was supposed to do a report, so I had her do it on Custer Died for Your Sins. So she really got fired up about it. She went to the school, and she was writing on the whiteboard, Custer Died for Your Sins. And the teacher came in and said, that is so inappropriate. Erase that. So that's where the battle is. You know, we can be scholars. We can liberate ourselves. But the, the littler people are still fighting this hardcore hand-to-hand -hand combat where she was. And you, I talk about, that's probably where Red Rage was present when I got to the school. But I think that the other thing is that um, in regard to treaties, the thing that impacted me, I think, was his concept of treaties because it led me to, I'm the chair of our treaty committee at home. And Grandpa Deloria actually signed the other, the further back grandpa signed the 1858 treaty of the Yankton. He did not want to sign the treaty and he was a troublemaker. So what Bishop Hare did, since he was in the church, he transferred him to Standing Rock to get him out of the way. And so it was an actual political reason to get rid of this guy, he's a troublemaker. And so then the family went, some, and there were already family up at Standing Rock, but those two were not separated by colonialism, it just happened to have different names. And so they went back and forth. And so I think that um, in regard to the treaty, I think that what I would like to say to you that I have learned from uncle and other people is that I'm not the only one that's a treaty signer. You are treaty signers. Those of you that are non-native, your country signed this treaty. All of the treaties, the 1851 treaty that relates to me, the 1868 for Chase's people, the 1858, and it goes on and on, your people signed that and you have every right and call to leadership to enforce that treaty to our benefit. So don't, I don't just allow us to do the emotional labor 
of getting, I was at a conference in Nevada yesterday and there was a tribal councilwoman that talked up to a congresswoman and we know the story. She said, I'm not gonna get all Indian crazy right now, but that's what happens. We have to get Indian crazy to get the point across and that takes so much stress. So if you really wanna help and be an ally for your generations, tell your children that they are treaty signers and they have an obligation to find out Every time a non-native person comes to me, because I have a lot of people who want to come live with me or learn from me, and I tell them, I need you to learn as much as you can, and you go to Washington. You go to wherever I, the UN, you know, I need you in those places. So if I'm gonna give you something, you give me back, and what you did is you signed that treaty and you enforce it. But that's what I think I learned from him. I would just, and this is uh, not as much as a story as uh, kind of a conversation we had, and that is, I think all of us need to do a better job of letting people know about 20th century heroes, mm. uh, whether it be Vine Delore or Lucy Covington, mm. or um, you can go down the list, Forrest Gerard, that people have contributed to this century in ways that are really dramatic, and Vine really understood that, and the power of those stories. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for at least one question. Does anybody have, a, any audience have a question for any members of our panel? Question? Over here? Good morning. So in preparing for this conference, I started rereading the book. And it was really interesting in the, in the cover, it says that chapter one and chapter four were initially published in Playboy magazine. Uh, what the heck? And so I think that really says a lot. And so what do you think about that? I think it was a different magazine in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the stories that I, I think Suzanne Harjo has told is that the order of the book was nothing. It was not the way it was in the book. And it wasn't written that way. It wasn't expected to be that way. And I think those essays really uh, reflect that. I think part of it for writers, where can you sell it? <laughs> where can you get an audience? And that probably was where it was in 1969. I think it's a... It was a whole different world in 1969. Um, some of you, I think most of you were born then. Um, but I think you just do wherever you have, whatever you have to do, wherever you got to get it done. And so sometimes we can sit here and talk about it because it got done. And so I've been in some real crazy places to say the things that I needed to say. And then they didn't always want to hear it, but at least I said it. So I think that comes into play. I like... Um... It's kind of, it remind, so Vine submitted these things to Playboy. That, that sounds like when our, when our people, our leaders, uh, went over to Europe to, to invade global pop culture. That's, that's what we're always trying to do. We're always trying to code switch our way into the, that, that, that oppressive uh, set of institutions. I, I have a, a, what do you call it, um, Indian savior complex, yeah? <laughs> I gotta go forth and preach the gospels <laughs> and try to re-spiritualize because it, it's, it's very real. It, I, I learned English language first. I can relate to everybody who inherited those archetypes. So I, would, I, would, I like that idea, although, you know, that's why we, we, we need to carry on his legacy because he would have something to say about, you know, Euro, hetero, patriarchy. What would he say right now about the gender fluid movement. Uh, any, any sort of these individual rights challenges that presents itself with indigenous sovereignty, we, we have to carry on that legacy and constantly code switch and try to invade these other spaces. I like it. Can I add something? Sure. I think the other thing is that his age, um, a long, long time ago in 19, my grandma told me to hurry up and get educated so I could be smarter than white people. That was her charge. And so I got my master's by the time I was 22 or 23, and I moved to Denver. I worked for the Coalition of Indian Control School Boards, and it was a pretty action place in Denver with the AHEC starting, the other organizations. And so I actually lived in 
older, and this is the first time I've come back since then. And I think that when I watched those older people that were in action, they were in the art of war. They put on the clothes that they needed to get the job done. And so I look back at some of those, like Via Medicine, she was scary. I mean, she was like a ninja lady. And so they did what they had to do, and I think that sometimes we forget that, yeah, yeah. is that they were doing what they needed to accomplish. And sometimes we get caught up in what is correct or what we should or shouldn't do, and we get worried about getting judged by people. But actually, it was just getting done what you had to do, no matter how you had to do it with ethics, of course, and that was the important thing that I think that distinguished him, is he had ethics. But at the same time, you could tell in some of his writings that he, kind, he really missed home, right? There were things where he learned this material and this religion, or this spiritual view, mm -hmm. but he wasn't there. But then this, all of America is our homeland. So I think that was a consolation to him, but to hear those constant stories of why we do what we do. And so that's what our job as elders is, to impart that to the younger ones. That it's, it's just the activism and the call to the art of war is the same. We just got to keep it going. So that's Thank my so much. Thank you so much. Nyawa, Nyawa Goa. I think that concludes this panel. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time.